What the Actual Fork podcast is co-hosted by two intuitive eating registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, owner of Fine Food Freedom, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. We can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we are medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest, darkest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So get comfy and join us for a casual convo where you can expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Welcome back to another episode of What the Actual Fork podcast. Jenna, how you doing? You know, I feel like I don't have something like queued up for you today, but I'm sure you just shared something with me off air that I thought was so cute. Which part? Your spray tan. Oh, today I'm super excited. And actually I would love to promote her. So I want to make sure I get the business um, stated properly, but today in like the next half hour, I have to go like scrub my makeup off my face. I have a mobile spray tan company coming to my house. She found me on Instagram. Um, it's her handle is at spray everybody. And she is your New Jersey based body positive spray artist. And her mission is to make all bodies feel comfortable getting spray tan, doing something that makes them feel good. And, you know, to get spray tanned, you have to be undressed. And her mission is to make that a more comfortable experience for all human beings. And I could not love that more. Um, I'm just excited for it, but also like, can't wait for Noah to like hop into the spray tan booth and also get tanned with me. Cause you know, that's going to happen. <laughs> not on purpose. <laughs> oh my gosh. Little Noah Did running around with a spray tan. <laughs> I love that. It would be just like a slash on his body. If it happened, it'll be the best. (laughs) But I'm good. Besides that, you know, it's almost the holidays, which is exciting. And I would say it's exciting because of, I feel like where I am in life. Um, And that's a really good feeling. How about you? I don't feel like much is going on other than which we say on every episode, my daughter is sick again. No. Um, but you know what? It's what like today. <laughs> um, so like last two nights, well, actually last night of sleep was pretty decent, which was great. Cause it was mom's night. Um, <laughs> daddy's like really night the too. other night was like <laughs> hellish. It was like, felt bad. Do you um, sleep when it's hellish? Like, can you fall back to sleep? Like when you hear her? Like, okay. cause in our house, the baby is like right next to us. So, like okay. Good question. So we do a couple different things, but if we know that like, it's been hellish days then and the one person can mentally handle it without like losing their shit, <laughs> we try to give that other person the night off. So like, if we need to, we'll sleep in separate bedrooms where it's like, you're so turning good. your sound machine on and you're like passing out because then you can recharge and hopefully be good to go the next night so like very lucky that like it's a good system yes Yes. (laughs) what we done luke like had a video in the morning at one point he had to like bring her into a steam shower like you know like put a steam shower going on in the bathroom and just bring her in there to try to get some of the the congestion out and it's just pitch black he tried to keep it dark like to keep her like you know calm or whatever and she's literally, you can't see anything. All you hear is like, <laughs> like at like midnight, you see the timestamp and she's just like wide awake, like screaming, laughing, like, and he's just like sitting there like, fuck my life. Um, <laughs> so shout out to my amazing husband for letting he's me see. the best. I'm telling you one of these days, somebody on this episode is going to be like, give me a number. <laughs> But she sneezed this morning while I was sitting in the steam shower with her before, um, you know, getting her ready for the day. And she sneezed and it was just like huge, like <laughs> snot rockets out the nose. And I'm just like, you know, that's normal, I guess. Like that, I, I just think she's always going to have congestion for the rest of her life. 
Yeah. I mean, it is, my mom actually said something to me yesterday. She was like, I think this is the first time I've seen Noah that he doesn't have snot running down his nose. And I'm like, great. It's he's almost two. <laughs> like, So just in it for that. Um, it's so hard, but I feel like I had a story that I didn't share on our podcast the other day, or I don't think we've even recorded since it's happened. It's so silly, but it made me think of this other thing I saw on TikTok. Have you seen the viral video of the mom and the daughter where they make coffee together and the daughter spills and the mom like, like doesn't like lash out at her, doesn't like, and she's just like, "Uh oh, and she like helps her. And it's like, have you seen this viral video? I've seen a video like that, but it was with a little boy. It's like that, um, that like like, gentle parenting account. I don't know what her name is. Which makes sense. I know exactly who you're talking about. Um, and he does a lot of the cooking and he's like this little kid that's like cooking eggs at like, like one years old or something. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So this kind of like that, but just as his mom that makes her iced coffee every morning with her daughter, but she puts like chocolate milk in hers and she lets her pour it. But it just went viral about how many people in the comment section were like, oh my gosh, like this healed me. And this one woman stitched it, which I was just like dying because she was like, she stitched like her, the daughter spilling it. And then the mom being like, "Uh oh, and like, let's clean it up. And then this, this woman stitched right at that part. I was like, I would have got my ass beat. <laughs> and like, I was dying laughing because I'm like thinking about how many people in our generation maybe like didn't get gentle parenting. No. <laughs> or it did like give me anxiety when she spilled the coffee. And then like this happened to me the other day with myself, we were like rushing to get on this virtual appointment, Luke and I, and I was like trying to like light a candle and make things calm. And then like my, I hooked the straw to my iced coffee. And when I tell you it hit my desk under my MacBook into the windowsill, down the windowsill through the like shutters. And I was like, Oh my fucking God, I'm going to (laughs) like, I, when I tell you the rage that like erupted (laughs) in me and, and at myself and it just like, it was like such a light bulb moment of like that TikTok of like, okay, like you're fine. Like, yeah, you spilled a coffee, but like, you're fine. And like, it's those things are starting to come up for me of like, obviously my daughter is going to spill everything and, throw <laughs> and smash everything into you know all over the place and I'm like okay like something I need to unpack um but it's, to just even be kind to myself in those moments you know what I mean well I I will always say this and like first of all I like said the gentle parenting part I think my mom gentle parented without it being the term because I really don't remember being like ever yelled at as a kid I really don't maybe I just have a bad memory mom um but I think like when I look at Noah and I see him like pushing through his like really big emotions what they call it like babies don't have and toddlers don't have like the prefrontal cortex to be able to like process emotions and what they mean and how they feel it's like it it shows up for them as rage but like when you see them get frustrated and you actually like physically with your eyes like see or visually see like the hands clenched and like the and like the anger and like the red face when like they can't get the lego onto like whatever it is I like stop for a second and I'm like is he doing this because he's seen me get this frustrated from like zero to whatever age? And it's like such a moment where like Matt and I said to each other the other day, like children really are like a direct reflection of your best and worst qualities. And they teach you so much. Like it's wild. I'm like, I don't ever want to look like what he's looking like right now. Like I got to (laughs) stop. And I do that like all the time, like with the silliest things. And then again, freaking TikTok. Like I saw this other TikTok of this woman. It was really, I think it was on someone's podcast where she was just like, she was at her friend's house getting ice out of the ice maker and like literally like dropped some cubes and was like, you idiot. And her girlfriend was like, what did you just say to my friend? And she was like, wait, what the fuck? Like I'm talking. And she was like, no one talks to my friend that way. And it was like, she said it was like, I don't know who this is. I can't credit them. But it was like such a light bulb moment of like the amount of times that I'm like, you fucking idiot, like to myself or something that I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Right. Um, and I feel Same like so many body image relate to <laughs> like, that. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so just trying to be kinder to myself in these moments. I love moments. that for you. I love that for my friends. I love that for my <laughs> friends. Um, so try to be kinder to yourself. Um, but let's talk about a way to be kinder to yourself is to follow today's oh my God. guest. Let's I'm get into it. it. Before we tell everybody who she is, I just like to you guest on our show today, like you are truly changing the game on social media and we really appreciate you. And all right, Sammy, tell everybody who it is. (laughs) Okay. I have to like gear up for all of these credentials that I don't like fuck them up. Okay. (laughs) We have Elena Eford here said her name, right? Eford. RDN, CD, CED, RD, CSSD. Jesus, Elena, did you do like, so many things? Um, registered dietitian, certified eating disorder dietitian, board certified specialist in sports dietetics. She earned her degree from Virginia Tech and is currently working as the lead dietitian at the Com Clinic. Elena works using metabolic testing and body composition analysis, which we talk about today, which is super interesting. Um, and uses these results to help individuals towards their journey in eating disorder recovery or breaking the cycle of chronic fad dieting. She started her TikTok sharing her experience with clients and their metabolic testing with much success. Elena has started using social media as a platform to break stigma with eating disorders and educate people on the toxic cycle diet culture promotes. Prior to her work at the Calm Clinic, Elena has worked in settings giving her excellent background in sports nutrition, eating disorders, weight management, and gastrointestinal complications. In her free time, Elena loves to explore new things with her husband and her dog and cheer on Virginia Tech football. She loves to travel both nationally and internationally, and any chance she gets, she loves to experience food and people in new places. And I think that she mentions this in it, but her handle on um, social media is her name and it's spelled E-F-I-R-D. Um, and on Instagram, it's E-P-E-F-I-R-D. I think she says it out loud, but just want to spell it just in case. Yes. <laughs> yes. And she's just, she's one of the good ones on TikTok to say the least. Like, I feel like oh we talk God. about she's so much. She's fighting the good fight. <laughs> yeah, she's fighting the good fight right alongside of us. And so we will add her to our TikTok army and just enjoy this amazing episode with Elena. All right, Elena, we're going to jump right into it with you because we want to know, and we know you're going to have many, <laughs> many answers to this first question. Um, what the actual fork podcast, of course, we start with our, what the actual fork moment. So we want to know from you, what is your, what the actual fork moment of the week of the month of the year, what has stopped you in your tracks lately and made you say what the actual fork is this? It's definitely of the year and it's carnivore. It just absolutely blows my mind that people are on social media eating testicles with butter and claiming that that's great. Did you see the guy that brought it on the airplane? I know I've talked about this before, but like, did you see that video where he literally like goes through security and he's like, my stick of butter made it. And he like takes out a testicle and a stick of butter and is like chowing down. Yes. (laughs) And I've also seen ones where people are like, this is my pre-workout snack. And they're quite literally just taking a bite out of a chunk of butter. It's like, I, <laughs> what have we come to? Yeah. I, I feel like Jenna, you've just recently been in like carnivore versus Jenna TikTok, where she was just going ha- like ham on the carnivore people. MD, I don't know the guy that did like all the steroids and shit. There's just, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so I'm, Jenna, Sammy's, add, not add on, there. Sammy's not on carnivore side of TikTok. Cause she just put both of them together. Carnivore MD and the liver king. Oh gosh. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm clearly not. I'm clearly not. No, I get all of those videos too. And that is always my answer because it blows my mind that I actually, I put this up the other day, like we have actual research studies for many, many years about the connection between heart health and red meat. And then people would rather believe that an all red meat diet is the key to health. Like I I don't, I don't know how to connect these dots anymore. Like I, I don't get it. Yeah. I can't wrap my head around it. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't, same thing. It does not connect for me. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity slash like BFF because I, Elena, like I binge watch your videos. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, like she's so fucking dead on with everything that you say that I am just so thrilled that you are here today. Um, and so can you tell our audience just a little bit more about you, your practice? I have in my notes, like ask her about the cool metabolic testing she does <laughs> with her patients, just a little bit more about who you serve and also how that brought you to taking down misinformation on TikTok? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I've been working as a dietitian for almost 10 years now, seven of which have all been in the treatment of eating disorders. So that used to be in North Carolina in like an inpatient setting. And then we moved to Vermont because my husband's doing his residency here. And I started working at the Calm Clinic, which is where I am now. And we treat eating disorders on an outpatient basis. Um, and yeah, to touch on the metabolic test, we do a metabolic test on everybody because what we've really learned is that the body, of course, adapts to eating disorder behaviors. And one of the biggest things that we're seeing is that metabolisms drop really, really low when the body is under fueled or when you're engaging in behaviors or things like that. Um, and it's really fascinating because, of course, that can come independent of any sort of weight changes or things like that. And so that's what we've been doing. And I really started a TikTok because, well, first and foremost, my sister was like, Elena, you've got to be on TikTok. There's so much bad information out there. And she's not in the nutrition field at all, but she just saw it and was like, I cannot believe that people are listening to this stuff. And so, you know, I started it, frankly, it was like a COVID thing. I was like, fine, I'll record some videos, whatever. <laughs> and I started posting things. And it was really interesting to me how little people know, not only about how our bodies work, but about eating disorders and a def definitely about size diversity, right? I mean, everybody thinks that if you're five foot four, you have to be the exact same height. And when you start to challenge that is when you get like the hate, you get the like, how could you possibly think that? Or like for me, right? I'm very mid-sized. So of course I get the like, maybe you should take your own advice, like that kind of thing. It's just, you know, the same and so to be honest, that was like fuel for the fire for me. I'm like, all right, <laughs> like, let's keep debunking this because clearly I'm striking a chord with someone here. And honestly, I really just like it. I know a lot of people get sort of fatigued with social media, but I'm doing my best to educate and I, I enjoy that. And it really actually has created a really good community. Despite the haters, there's like great people that I know are super supportive and learning a lot. So, well, one of like, First of all, I am one of the supporters who's like, let's keep going. But the one video you did post about size diversity, I think the comment section was like actually very supportive in, I think it was the one about your sister actually, and about how, you know, she eats a lot and she just happens to be a naturally thin person. Can you talk more about that video? Yeah. Oh, so so <laughs> basically the video was exactly that. Me talking about my sister, she's very naturally thin, just a very small person. And she eats a lot of food. I mean, she's just one of those people that, you know, every two hours, she's like, I need to eat something. And she eats really big meals. And, you know, it, my family, we're all pretty big eaters. We've got a good appetite. And she's just stayed this smaller size. And so what I was challenging is, of course, the video that I stitched in that is, these people saying that they think being fat is a choice that you just, you know, you're just choosing to not take care of yourself. And it was just so, you know, not considering everything else that goes on in life and all of the other factors. And yes, the comments were actually very supportive. There were lots and lots of people saying, you know, I totally agree. I have a friend like this, or I'm like this or whatever it was, which is great. But a lot of people either stitched it or duetted it being like, why are you lying? I can't believe, you know, and then you get the laws of thermodynamics comments. And <laughs> that is so. such a dietitian joke. Can I just say like <laughs> uh, the way that us three are like, like snickering and laughing, like laws of thermodynamics, but I just like picture that at like a holiday event, like, and that just like wouldn't hit, right? Like people have no idea what you're saying, but anyway, I just, <laughs> that was such a moment I love. <laughs> yeah and so that video was just challenging that like j sh this my sister is naturally a thin person why couldn't someone naturally also be a different size and a bigger body whatever it might be and people's minds just like explode when you bring up that topic it oh 
such a good point. And Jenna, I'm actually so happy you asked that because I was thinking the same thing and we didn't even have that written down. So that's how much we've stalked your content where I feel like we know all of your videos by heart now. Um, and there's, there's just so much education that needs to be done. And, and that's why we're so happy that you're here and that you have a TikTok. And it's also so refreshing to hear you be so charged positively about social media because I feel like Jenna I don't want to speak for you but like we've had some conversations on this podcast of just feeling like so burnt out sometimes or just like our heads are hitting a wall so it's amazing to see you just being like oh no that like fuels my fire let's fucking go <laughs> um so that's that's super exciting so we want to dive into more about eating disorder recovery with you because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I think a lot of people just don't know. Um, so if you can speak to, we have a couple of different ways we want to take this conversation, but more specifically, if you want to talk about, you know, metabolism with eating disorders, I know you shared a little bit, but what you guys see in practice, how you use, um, I think you have a specific like measure that you use in your, your treatment center. So just a little bit behind that. Um, and if you would recommend intuitive eating for someone actively re uh, recovering from eating disorder as well. Yeah. So, well, the metabolic test that we use, of course, tells us someone's resting metabolic rate, how many calories their body is burning to do absolutely nothing. And a lot of times when someone, again, is engaging in eating disorder behaviors, that number drops, meaning if, you know, using those like calculators to estimate metabolic rate or whatever. Let's say yours is supposed to be 1400. Sometimes we'll see it as low as 800 because the body is trying to conserve energy to keep you alive because of whatever behaviors you've been using. On the flip side, sometimes we will also see that their metabolic rate has not dropped, but we're like, hey, your body needs 1400 calories to do nothing, to lay in bed all day. And that's really helpful for the eating disorder because the eating disorder has convinced them that if I'm not doing anything, I need zero calories, right? Or whatever it's said. So that's really helpful for that education piece. The other thing that we look at that you were mentioning is a body composition. And the reason we do that is to look specifically at lean mass and muscle mass, because when you think of some of the symptoms of eating disorders, things like being cold all of the time or bloating or other GI issues, or even when it gets really serious, when they start to have organ failure and issues and electrolyte imbalance, a lot of that is because their behaviors have caused the body to break down and chip away at lean mass and muscle mass. So we use that as sort of a tool to say like, okay, your lean mass is really low. This proves to me your body's asking for more fuel. So it's really just a way to like really give that education because the eating disorder is going to come in and be like, this dietitian doesn't know anything. I'm not going to listen to her. She's just trying to make you gain weight. She doesn't care about anything else. And so when we have more evidence to be like, no, actually, this is how your body is compensating because of what you're doing. It really, really helps. Um, and so that's why we use it. I mean, I think it's great. And it, yeah, I, I'm one of the people that likes working with eating disorders. A lot of people really struggle for one reason or another, but people need the recovery. They need the help. And we're so thankful that you are because I... I mean, I personally love it as well, but I also struggle with not having access to the tools that you have, which I have to imagine makes that these conversations somewhat easier to convince both the eating disorder brain and the person that, you know, they really do need to eat more. They absolutely <laughs> do. And to answer your question about the intuitive eating piece, yes with most of the principles, the only one that we have to challenge is listening to your hunger and fullness, because of course their hunger and fullness can definitely be impacted from restricting or purging or whatever the behavior is. So a lot of times the conversation is actually as weird or as counterintuitive as it seems, I need you to eat more intentionally as opposed to intuitively right now. And then the goal is that we get your hunger and fullness to a place where it feels good, you're getting hungry consistently, then we can trust it. But the rest of the principles of intuitive eating, we absolutely go by. I mean, those are super, super helpful with, you know, food freedom and learning that foods aren't bad and all of, all of the things, gentle nutrition, all of it. <laughs> I'm so happy you brought that up though, because I think, you know, I, I, we'll get inquiries all the time being virtual of, you know, someone who is 
actively in the thick of a clinically diagnosed eating disorder and wants to meet with our team virtually, you know, once a month, let's say, and we're like, no, 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 like that's not enough care right now. Obviously eating disorders are a spectrum and there's different eating disorders. And so we could go so many different ways with this, but like, I love that you brought up, like in the beginning, there has to be more structure because we cannot trust our hunger and fullness cues because I always use the analogy of like a light switch, um, like the, the really fancy bougie kind with like the dimmer. Right. So like when we have an eating disorder, like we have hunger and fullness cues, but they've been so dimmed that they're just, they're not on. Right. So we have to like learn how to turn up that switch so we can actually use it again. It's still in the wall. We didn't rip it out of the wall. It's just not on right now. And we have to turn it on to be able to listen to the cues. Um, and so that's really important to hear because, and I'm excited to share this episode with people that are struggling with eating disorders, because of course the goal is to get to intuitive eating, but sometimes we can't do it right out of the gate. Um, and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with that, you know, that person or, or you, if you're listening to this with an eating disorder, it's just, we need to get those cues in place. So I'm so happy you brought that up. When you were going like this with your hand, Sam, and for everybody looking, she was doing something with a light switch, but it looked like that mini violin that is my entire fucking FYP right now. Like <laughs> if I hear that sound one more time, I might lose my mind, but now that's all that's replaying in my head. Anyways, speaking of my For You page, Elena, yesterday I was scrolling. It could have been this morning, who knows anymore, but I saw a post that was really terrifying because it was a young girl I don't know how old she was but she was definitely late teens maybe early 20s at the most and in the post she said something like it was like a contradiction of like her brain like if I'm so fearful of weight gain why am I binging so hard every night and I of course commented because I'm like oh my god like you need help like trying to like you know, say it's your body trying to save you. Like you need to eat, you know, do you have support? And the comment section was just like, you know, very pro Anna in to, for lack of a better way to describe it. And it was very, very scary. And one of the things that you put on, um, our list today to talk about is just bringing more awareness to the severity of eating disorders. And I would love to know just like from your perspective of how social media has changed your practice over the past seven years that you've been working in ED recovery and like with the past three to four being very TikTok explosive maybe like have you seen any differences there yeah I mean well I've definitely seen a lot of people coming in doing things that they've seen on TikTok and that's why you know some people would disagree but that's why when people do post things like that or people post their what I eat in a day is they're super low calorie, I tend to comment or stitch or whatever because they're like, oh, well, they're just showing what they're doing. Like, let them do their thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. Someone's seeing this and think, thinking if I do what you do, I'm going to look like you. And I see that coming into my office all of the time. So it's definitely changed my practice in terms of that, just what's coming in and where they're getting their nutrition information. It's also changed it in realizing that so many people have disordered eating, but it's been so normalized, they don't even realize it. They just come in and, you know, I even have people coming in saying that they just, I don't know, want to be healthier. Like, I just kind of want to see where my metabolism is. And then we like start talking. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like super disorder. And even their language around food, everything that they're doing. And I think it's because of exactly what you just said. You know, we see these videos on social media that it's like, oh yeah, I resonate with that. So it must be normal and not even realizing that it's disordered. So it's almost like that's getting masked in some ways because of what people see on social media. That is such a good point. Like, so how do you navigate those conversations? If somebody's coming in for the folks that are obviously, you know, makes sense that social media specifically is going to fuel eating disorder behavior. 
But how about the people that genuinely come to you thinking like, I just want to be healthier and I'm doing all of these things. Like, how do you navigate those conversations? Well, this might not come as a surprise, but I'm a little brutally honest. I'm nice about it. But a lot of times I'm like, you know, some of what you're saying sounds like your relationship with food might have been impacted. And we sort of like get into that conversation or maybe they'll say something like, oh, you know, I treated myself to a sandwich and I'll be like, why'd you say that? You know, just to like get into that conversation of like, what, what a treat. A... <laughs> right? Like, what about the sandwich made you feel like this was a treat? And of course, it's the two slices of bread, which is blasphemous and all of those things. So, um, but to be honest, I sort of just tell them. Uh, <laughs> um, sometimes that's not at the first visit. Sometimes that's after we've gotten to know each other. But I, I try to be honest. I mean, I don't want them to continue to think that it's normal. It's yeah, like I, I can, I don't even know what to say at this moment because it's wild and it's very scary. And I personally am so grateful for your page because I send a lot of people to it to say like, oh, you have questions about this? Like, go take a look and we'll make sure we share all of those links in the show notes. But, you know, just speaking about the eating disorder recovery path, you once posted a TikTok <laughs> that... I believe it was about a client session and in the session, your client had mentioned to you, maybe they were further on in their recovery or feeling more secure in their habits and where they were going um, in their recovery journey. And maybe they asked you something along the lines of like when they could start focusing on weight loss again. And your answer was, of course, so beautiful and eloquent and just stated like never. Um, and I think that that's a tough thing for a lot of people to hear, but also so important for a lot of people to hear. Can we expand a little bit more on that amazing video? Yeah, I, I stand by that. If you've had an eating disorder, even if it's been years recovered, I don't think weight loss is ever going to be your goal ever again, because that's what likely got you into the disordered eating or eating disorder in the first place. And so we sort of have to think of it of like, okay, let's say for whatever reason, you're like, all right, now I'm going to focus on weight loss. What are you probably going to do? You're probably going to try to, I don't know, count your calories in some way. Maybe you're not even going to track it, but you're going to try to do something or you're going to try to ramp up exercise. And then what's going to happen is your eating disorder, even if it hasn't been there for years, is going to sneak back in and be like, you missed the gym today. You shouldn't eat as much or, you know, whatever. All of those things come back really, really quickly. And it's a very slippery slope. And in all the years I've been working, I've yet to see it be where, Someone can, I don't know, go back to some of those behaviors, I guess you could call them, without it falling back into disordered eating. Now, what I always tell people is that's not to say you can't, of course, try to like make some changes. Like if you have goals of you want to, I don't know, not order takeout as much and you want to cook at home, I'm happy to help you to do those things. But when the goal is weight loss, we know what that leads to because- it's what they did before, tracking and obsessing over this and counting calories and trying to make sure that you're at the gym for a certain number of time or burning enough calories or blah, 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 blah. And then we're right back into it. Such a great point you bring up with some of those gentle nutrition and or joyful movement, you know, behaviors that we can incorporate. I think there's such a misconception. Obviously, we all know this on this podcast of, you know, intuitive eating or eating disorder dietitians are anti-health promoting, right? That's this myth that's out there. So you just gave a perfect example of if you genuinely want to, your example, right? Cook more at home, you know, use more ingredients from scratch, try more recipes. Like none of that is inherently bad, right? Like we can look at our intentions behind our behaviors and say, if I want to do this to genuinely impact my health in a positive way, there is nothing wrong with that. So if you don't mind just expanding on that, I think that could be really helpful. What are some examples of health promoting behaviors that as an eating disorder dietitian that you're like, these are not inherently bad. These can impact your health in a positive way. And they have nothing to do with shrinking your body. Yeah. So of course, what we just said, maybe you want to cook at home more, maybe you want to try new recipes. 
Um, some other ones that I've talked about with people is they genuinely just want to add more plants to their diet. They're not going plant-based. They just want to do that. And it's not because it's low calorie, high volume. It's because they feel better or they have a little bit more energy or there's just lots of other reasons behind it. Other food ones that I've heard is, you know, trying to make their breakfast a little bit bigger and add some protein to it because they know that that gets them through their work morning a lot better and they're not, you know, crashing or whatever it might be. When it comes to the exercise piece, the biggest conversation that we always have is what do you actually like to do? You know, if you don't like to go to the gym, don't go to the gym. If you don't like to run, don't run. I actually just had this conversation with a client the other day. They were like, you know, what I really like to do is just like put on a podcast or put on an audiobook and walk. And I was like, so do it. They're like, but it's, that doesn't really count, does it? I was like, of course it counts. Like you're moving your body in a way that you really enjoy. You're going to dedicate time to yourself and you're going to do it. And so Again, none of those things were in an effort to shrink their body or change their body. It's just like, those are things they enjoyed. It was time themselves or it helped their energy or helped their work day or their brain function and sort of all of those other goals, which are so much more important. One thing I have my clients focus on is, are you having cravings for things? If you're craving sugar in the afternoons, you might not be eating enough earlier in the day. That's one thing to look at. That's sort of like a non-scale thing. Or even like, how are you sleeping? Or how are your hunger levels? Those kinds of things are so much more important to focus on. I love that. And I also just have to add to the fitness conversation. I feel like it was somewhere during like the birth of, and please don't come for me, Orange Theory, but like somewhere of like the birth of like Orange Theory fitness era of like this group coaching where people got this idea that unless you're like literally crawling out of the class, like sweating and like dying, that you didn't splat work, points. Right. Like that you didn't work out. Like it wasn't worth it. Like quote unquote. And, and I was that person. And like then you start to like look at <laughs> thank you. Then you start to like look at like what that's actually doing to the human body and like getting your heart rate up that high for that long so consistently and creating that like constant need to go back mentally like it's really not very healthy <laughs> like it's it's just this concept and then you tell people to walk and they're like but does it count like count for what yeah, like, like, I what? don't like what do we mean <laughs> and it's like they they enjoy it but they won't do it and I, and when I say they like add me, me into this conversation <laughs> please like I am no exception to this but like yeah there's like this part of your brain that's like well if I'm not like Ripping. literally like can't walk anymore from pain then like why do it and it's like you're totally right Jenna it like reminds me of the that orange theory era and yeah, nothing I, against orange theory if people right. enjoy it right like that's again it just exploded and it was yeah. like the fitness studio and probably still is I'm just removed from it but <laughs> Anyways, um, Elena, I feel like we didn't give enough conversation to why you hate the carnivore diet. So like for anybody who's like not necessarily up to our latest episodes or um, is listening to this and is like, I don't even know why it's such a bad thing from your professional perspective, not my emotional, like I hate fucking testicle juice. <laughs> Can you give my listeners, your eloquent radio or uh, elevator pitch on why it's not a good, why it's not a good thing to follow. <laughs> so, well, okay. There's just one, there's no evidence to support it, right? I mean, we have tons of evidence saying that our bodies need fiber. We need vitamins and minerals that are going to come from fruits and veggies and that we need a wide variety of foods for all of the different nutrients that they offer us. So to then say that you should quite literally only be eating meat is just like going against everything we know about the human body and how it functions. And so it's just wild to me that that's become a thing. I mean, on, then of course, what it's also doing is vilifying every other food. I mean, you see, you know, people on TikTok going around like taking kale out of people's shopping carts being like you don't want to eat this it's like I'm sorry what I mean yeah and so what's what bothers me the most about it too is that people are claiming that it's a lifestyle and you can do it forever and you know I feel so great on it one if you did feel better on it it's probably just because you're eating more protein but two how is it a lifestyle? Like, let's say you go travel. How exactly are you going to like 
go out to a nice restaurant in this new city or new country or whatever that you're in and be like, excuse me, I'm just going to take your steak and a pat of butter. Like what? I just, again, it, it, the connection doesn't draw for me because there's no research behind it. They'll claim that there is, but there's not. It blows my mind. Do you think they ever poop? Like, no. Oh, that's, that's the other thing. thing. Yeah. How? They how have to take all these. They go to the bathroom. <laughs> they have to take all these supplements. I've seen people on TikTok being like, "Okay, when you're carnivore, don't forget to take like magnesium and all that stuff." And I've literally commented and been like, "You know, you could just eat vegetables and like <laughs> do all of those things." Uh, yeah. I mean, and like, then you're also forgetting, like, don't forget your $12,000 worth of roids, but like, that's, that's not what's going to be shown on there either. Besides the point, but thank you for that. Like the evidence, there is no evidence to support it. And it goes against the evolution of like everything we've learned, <laughs> like everything. Um, It makes no sense, but thank you for that. I feel like we like rapid fired you <laughs> in all of our questions. Sam, did I miss anything? <laughs> I don't think we missed anything that like we wanted to get to, but I, I would love to kind of close with, with you to just ask you like for anybody listening to this podcast, if you want them to walk away from this episode and they would only remember one thing from you, what would you want that to be? What would you want our listeners to hear from you? And it doesn't have to be anything we talked about. It can be just anything related to eating disorder recovery. I think the biggest thing is anybody can have an eating disorder. They don't discriminate. Literally any human can have an eating disorder. I will say, I'm sorry if someone has invalidated that for you and told you that, oh, you don't because of X, Y, and Z, but keep advocating for yourself and don't let your eating disorder take over and be like, oh yeah, I went to this doctor and they didn't think my weight was this or whatever it is and then not seek help. Anybody can have an eating disorder and everybody deserves recovery. And even though it might be hard, it is so worth it to have that food freedom and not be living entrenched in the throes of that eating disorder. I love that. I love that so much. So for everybody listening, that's like, okay, I need to go follow and and binge on your social media like Jenna and I do, where can they find you? So on TikTok, they can find me just under Elena Eford just my name on Instagram. It's E P E for, but if you type in Elena E for I'm sure it will come up. Uh, my clinic, the calm clinic also has a YouTube. I'm mostly on it, but there is one other dietitian on there. If you guys want to check that out. Um, but yeah, that's where all my stuff is and where you get to see all of the, you know, fun comments. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of What the Actual Fork Pod. We know there are a lot of pods out there and we are so grateful that you are here listening with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, share with all your friends and faves and follow along with us on social at What the Actual Fork Pod. We promise to continue to bring you the hottest topics, greatest guests, and the most fun you can possibly have while fighting diet culture bullshit. We love you, we appreciate you, and we will see you next week for a lot more fun.